Well, the, my transparency would be very different. A hundred percent transparency. I would want my citizens to know where the money is going. I also would, I would democratize education so people could choose how their kids go to school. I, I believe in school choice. Uh, I want to add, I, I'm going to, an emphasis on education, tr trades, uh, the arts, all, all the things that are getting lost. I, I'm getting, I want to do away with core curriculum if possible, uh, as much as I can. I want teachers to teach. Teaching is an art. I've taught myself. It's an art. You don't want to be bogged down with bureaucracy if you don't need to. Students have individual needs. Those need to be addressed. Can I pause for a second and, and just note that uh, we got Brian on here who's getting uh, Congressman Massey on, and our typical lineup includes like homeless people that believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Welcome to the Brian Nichols Show, your source for common sense politics on the We Are Libertarians Network. The Brian Nichols Show is the fastest growing liberty podcast that brings together people from all means of political thought as we seek to have meaningful conversations about the issues you care about. At the Brian Nichols Show, our goal is to leave the audience educated, enlightened, and informed. And now your host, Brian Nichols. Well, happy Sunday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you for joining us on our special Sunday Candidate Highlight Series here in the program where we're talking to all those amazing Liberty candidates who are out there fighting the good fight, putting their neck on the line and running for office to help make some real substantive change in their communities via the form of policy. And today's candidate is one Stacy Prussman from New York City, and she is running for New York City mayor as a libertarian. That's right. So a great opportunity to meet Stacy, but also discuss some of the issues specifically impacting New York City and how libertarian or just liberty ideas can actually be the solutions to the problems. A great episode. And please, folks, if you're interested in learning more about Stacy's campaign, make sure you head to the show notes and go ahead, check out her website and more. So that being said, on to the show, Stacy Pressman here on The Brian Nichols Show. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Stacy. thank you so much for joining the program. And thank you to start off for what you are doing. And that is facing this incredible large mountain ahead of you. And that is running for the mayor role in New York City. We've seen right now over the past how many years, Mayor de Blasio turning the place into a, a very distant memory of what it used to look like. You see a problem in New York and you said it's time to make a change. Stacy, what got you though? What was, I guess, the number one thing that pushed you over the edge to get you to run for mayor of New York City? Well, a lot of, I, I've been thinking about it for many years. It's not the first time I've decided to do, excuse my background, my bed. I'm in my mom's house. Uh, this is my childhood bedroom, actually. <laughs> um, so the, you, this is like my... Kate Bush pillow. And so I'm sorry that it's a mess, but uh, I, my mom has been ill. Um, basically, uh, I've been, been wanting to do this since 2016 or 15. When I was doing radio, I announced it. They made fun of me. I said, I really want to do it. And then when we were locked down, uh, I also had spoken to Larry Sharp and I found the picture actually on Halloween in uh, 2018. And he's like, give me a call. And I called him during the pandemic. And that's how it started. So it, this is like a, not a new thing. Gotcha. Yeah. And now you are running and you mentioned as we were doing the, uh, the the intro here beforehand, you're running as the first libertarian endorsed candidate in all of New York State. What an honor. Yeah. I mean, I'm the first libertarian endorsed uh, uh, candidate uh, that's been announced as a mayor. Like I'm the first mayoral endorsed candidate. Oh, okay. Gotcha. No. We had our convention, our New York convention. Uh, the Democrats, Republicans will have their convention primaries. So we already had ours. I have the nomination from the party, and now we are running, and we are moving forward, and it's very exciting. Very exciting indeed. So let's kind of go from here, because right now we're recording in an era of COVID-19, and thankfully we seem to be on the ups, upswing, but big cities, especially in those big cities in the Northeast, I, I'm hailing here from Philadelphia. I saw it firsthand. I'm seeing it still firsthand, Stacy, and I'm sure New York, it looks like a completely different city. Broadway has been closed, clubs completely yeah. shuttered. What's it like, though, actually being there on the ground, experiencing it for yourself firsthand? Well, as somebody who's lived and been born in New York, worked in New York in theater, does stand-up comedy, I perform stand-up comedy on a regular basis. I uh, work in the film industry as well as other types of industries. I'm a speaker. It is oddly 
Uh, Manhattan specifically feels really odd. It feels like it has the pieces of it of once being alive and pieces of it being dead. It has a very facade of a normality, but once after a certain hour, it feels like a different city. Yeah. That, well, I'm seeing that too. Philadelphia You're, quite often. Like yeah. I've been down to certain areas of Philadelphia that after like 11, everything shut down. It feels like that now. I was like just going to say the literally the exact same experience here. You'll be driving down the main drag there in, in center city and you look around and it just feels, it just feels different. Everything about it just feels like it the just energy. Feels different, right. The energy yeah. feels different. Um, you know, people think, did you want to run because of the pandemic? And I, and, I, and it's, and you know, people blaming de Blasio, and, you know, our leadership has a lot to do with it. People, you know, of the closings, of the lockdowns, you know, going on so long with not much, and then opening and closing, and it didn't make much sense in terms of science. You know, maybe in the beginning, we didn't know what was going on, but then when we sort of figured it out, we were still locking down, and why are things closed early? And there's a lot of reasoning that doesn't make sense to why things are happening scientifically. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you politicize a disease, or, uh, you know, that kills people, it's very dangerous. And I found that and angered me. And I think that wasn't the reason why I wanted to run. And, you know, that's a lot of stuff is state run anyway. But I feel that I'm the person to bring New York back to life, wake it the hell up. Make, I want to make it 24 hours. I want people to thrive, be free, to run their businesses as they see in a, you know, a nice, healthy manner. I want New York to be a, a city that it once was, but not once was like in a bad way, but like a. Right. Alive, you know. Yes. <laughs> Alive, the heartbeat. Get it back Alive. again. Yes. It needs and, and, that heartbeat. It needs to wake the fuck up. <laughs> yes, and well, then that right there, that, seeing this reoccurring theme across the board, Republican, Democrat, conservative, libertarian, socialist, is that people are identifying across the board that something is wrong, and and we just feel that it, there spiritual. needs to be. It's a spiritual yes. issue, and I don't know. It's not a God thing. It's a spiritual feeling, a spirit of how we feel in our city. And you, you know, you can't put your finger on that. That's not yep. politicized. That's not something you could, you know, when you walk into a room and you feel a certain way, that's what it feels like when you come into the city, specifically Manhattan. The outer borough is not so bad in most of the, where my mom lives and where I, I'm, you know, where I live, but in other places it feels odd. It doesn't yeah. feel quite right. You know, it's like a, you meet somebody on the street or you're on a blind date like there's something not right about that person. That's what it feels like. And you can't put your finger on it. It's not a specific, you know, they it's not like they ate their food a certain way or they ordered. It's just the way they were. And you just couldn't explain it to somebody. Well, that's what the city feels like. Now, you're you're from Brooklyn and you get to see one governor, Andrew Cuomo, who also hails from New York City, specifically, I believe, Brooklyn as well. Right. And oh, Queens. Uh, uh, Queens. OK, right next door. So. You see a very different, I think, um, a different reception from what the governor had just, what, a year ago compared <laughs> to what he had now. And I think it's entirely in his fault, right? I mean, he's putting these COVID patients back into nursing homes. He's completely ignoring the science. You mentioned it. You're starting to play politics with a disease that's actually impacting real people's lives. And in this case, it's actually killing people. So Stacy, you are proposing something on your website. And this, this gets me so ecstatic because we need this so more in terms of libertarians offering solutions. And you have a solution. It's I'm a solution like libertarian. Plan. I'm like, I'm yes. a, you know, very pragmatic. Um, to open up using health grading systems similar to how they have in food. I don't know, Philly. I think Philly, do you have ABCD food grading? I'm not food? entirely sure. I, I well, think they have safe sure here. It, and, you know, it saved my stomach because, <laughs> um, you know, I used to eat in a C grade restu Japanese restaurant and I didn't realize it mm. <laughs> and they got closed down. But, you know, where we grade to one through five, you, you know, have a very, uh, you do all the, the right things and then you go above and beyond, you get like a five, you know, and it goes over down to one. And obviously, so if you have, you know, the social distancing and the, you know, there's ways to make a restaurant really safe or, or, or any establishment really safe and you could stay open. And I don't think there should be an hour limit. If you, if you want to open your restaurant until two, I think you should be allowed to do that. I don't see why that would, COVID doesn't get uh, more active at night. So I don't see, or <laughs> early in the morning. So I mean, there's no scientific base for that except for control from the government. So I think if you want to have a restaurant and stay open until two in the morning, you should have it. And, and we live in a society where people aren't working nine to five anymore. They right. work 12 
between. You know, you know, I have friends that work overnight shifts or they work into the middle of the night. I do shows till two in the morning. I did shows till two in the morning. So, you know, our society is changing on the hours that we work. You know, we're not working in this very people. Are, we're in a gig economy as well. People work for yep. themselves more. They're doing Uber, they're doing Lyft, all these types of jobs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say Uber, Lyft. Like, I mean, I, I remember delivery, once. I was... Delivery services are very big now for oh, yeah. like older, older people. Um, people work for, you know, bigger, you know, uh, delivery.com, all those different companies. So I think we're working, we're, we need to look at our society and our city differently. People are not working the way they used to work. One company their whole life and they retire. It's not like that anymore. So you see, when you're looking, when you're looking at New York specifically, and you're seeing this change, right? And, and one of the things about living in a big city used to be the experience. The and we mentioned this earlier, the heartbeat, almost that that unspoken thing that's just there. But with the cities changing, and and you've mentioned this as the economy has started to change, and maybe cities aren't the the beacons of economic activity that they once were, where you'd have to go into a physical location to meet face to face. My day job. I'm in the greater telecommunications and cybersecurity industry. So we're okay. entirely responsible for trying to connect people, you know, multiple thousands of miles away so we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. And we're seeing more and more folks that were thinking about going back to the office saying, well, maybe we don't need to spend a couple thousand dollars a month in rent for that, you know, that apartment down in center city or, or, you know, to have it right there in the outskirts of, of town, just to make sure it's easier for people to commute because Maybe we don't need people to commute anymore. So how does New York City rebound in a world where the economy is quite literally changing and it's going to be completely different from what we saw back in 2019? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we people are not commuting into offices unless they absolutely have to. I think offices are downgrading. The, you know, the real estate was always so expensive in New York, particularly both commercial and residential. So I think we want to see a big change in size of offices. Uh, we want to, you know, reform zoning. So we could maybe make some of those places work, work. Uh, I think there'd be more, more work housing. I don't know. We work, uh, not, I was going to say work study, work, working from home where maybe you have a little office downstairs where you're not specifically in your apartment, but maybe you have a little cubicle thing right. and you can rather than, because people don't want to be in their own homes, maybe just to get out of their house where there's a call, you know, there's going to be things like that. I don't like a we work, but it more maybe with a residential component to it. There's a lot of, innovative ideas right now that are going Malls. through my if mind. I was, if I was yeah. a mall owner and I was like, I have so much space here and think about it. Like if you're a restaurant, you're just trying to like avoid being in the compacted area. I mean, here in Philly, I know we still have res uh, restaurant restrictions for the number of occupants per indoor dining space. So it's like, if I'm a restaurant owner, screw this. I'm, I'm getting out of a big city. I'm not dealing with Mayor Kenny and his insane rules. I'm going to go to a, a town or a county outside of the big city where maybe there's a mall and I can go ahead and buy a spot there and open up a gigantic eatery and, and say, screw it. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Now the city's lost their my, my tax revenue and they've lost some reason that people would be going to the city to go actually explore beyond my restaurant, go to different stores, go sure. and explore every uh, the, the sites to see. I mean, New York City, you have quite literally the best places to go explore, but that's soon to be probably the only thing that people are really going to be showing up for. I mean, we don't, Broadway's going to be open, but that's going to take a while. And, yeah. you know, they're probably not going to be a hundred percent capacity. Uh, I, I don't know what, how that's working. And it takes a long time to get a show up. And there's a lot of, and there's also a lot of, there's a lot of jobs that go around a show. It's not just the people on the stage and the stage hands and the directors and the people it's to be, you know, the people who print the programs, the, right. the restaurants around and the, pre theater restaurants and post theater restaurants, you know, that type of stuff. So it's a lot. It's, you know, we're the, we were the hub of culture and art and I believe we're going to come back in a less commercialized way. I, I think that we'll have a lot of small theater, more jazz clubs, music clubs, comedy clubs, and a smaller type of venue. It's not going to be these, we got very commercialized over the years, I believe like, through, and I think we'll see more independent, producers and you know people like my friends putting on their one woman show i think that's going to come back what like in the 90s when i came into the city from college there were a lot of people doing their one woman shows and it was very affordable to rent a theater for a few nights and have your friends come to see you in a nice theater i think that's going to happen again i so, think, I, think so I, have, I have positive expectations for new york city
I say, and you come from the the background of comedy, right? So maybe for folks who aren't familiar with your background, this is your 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 bread and butter of what you experienced growing up. I say, growing going through, you know, earning your stripes is is actually going out, talking to people face to face, building up the resume. And now it's going to be interesting because the the old avenues. And I was actually just listening to a, to an episode with uh, Dave Smith and Joe Rogan, and the old avenues that used to be out there of going out to, to the traditional club, right? The the you know comedy joint that you would have in your, your local city. It, it's very different. It's, it's not, it's not the same path that used limited. to be there. Like I performed this weekend spots are limited, you know, where you'd have 18, you know, three spots a night, the, the, the less shows, less people, you know, allowed to be at the shows. So it's not like I can go out every night and do three or four spots or two spots. Even it's, it's like a big occasion to be able to do a live show right now right. for a lot of comedians. It's not, you know, so easy to get a live show. It's so sad because it's it's literally livelihoods that are being destroyed. And I mean, partly oh, it's of, right. like it's I mean, a lot of comedy clubs did survive. Like, uh, Dangerfields didn't uh, survive. That might have been because the owner also passed away. I believe that could have mm. also. But it didn't. So, you know, and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen moving forward. You know, yeah. you need a lot of capital to own your property. Uh, there's a rent, I think there's a rent moratorium right now. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I'm positive that it'll come back in a different way. There are people, well, you know, yeah. know, owning clubs and they're doing better than the clubs that were existing prior to the pandemic. So, you know, it, things are going to be different. They're just going to be different. And people are resilient. To, we're resilient and folks. People, you know, people make things work. The government doesn't change. You know, as it, when things, you know, other than the lockdowns and people rebelled against that, uh, you know, and other than all the restrictions, people will make the city come back. I won't. You will. Because I will allow you to. That's right. Spike Cohen, you are the power. And let's talk about you being the power, Stacey. Help, well, at least helping incentivize people to be the power. And that is if you were to... Uh, not if, when you are elected mayor of New York City, what would a Stacey Pressman administration look like, especially when compared to the existing administration with one Bill de Blasio? What would that uh, discrepancy be? Well, the, my transparency would be very different, 100% transparency. I would want my citizens to know where the money is going. I also would, I would democratize education so people could choose how their kids go to school. I, I believe in school choice. Uh, I want to add, I, I'm going to, an emphasis on education, tr trades, uh, the arts, all, all the things that are getting lost. I, I'm going to, I want to do away with core curriculum if possible, uh, as much as I can. I want teachers to teach. Teaching is an art. I've taught myself. It's an art. You don't want to be bogged down with bureaucracy if you don't need to. Students have individual needs. Those need to be addressed. And I believe very much in individuality and of a student and not just clumping people together in groups even. So just individuality. And I want to democratize schools. So you vote on who's running your schools, how your schools are running, who's teaching your kids, you know, right. you're the parents and students. I'm not, I want to, I want to take away the power. I know that sounds crazy, but I want to also take away a lot of bureaucracy. I think there's so much bureaucracy to get things done. I want to streamline things. Professional licensing needs to be reformed. Uh, that's a very important professional licensing is a lot of junk too. I want to reform that. The zoning issues, which are systemically racist and not pro-climate friendly. So we need to do a lot of different things. There are a lot of people that have been getting uh, cronyism over the years, and I'm not in that cronyism, so that's going to end. And I want this, the subways to run smoothly. We run on our subways. There's no reason why you should be stuck in between you know, cars or whatever, uh, stations for 20 minutes. That can't happen. We need to stop that. That needs to stop happening. So all those things, I want everything to be financially stable, fiscally responsible. Uh, the money that is being spent, you know, I, I, I think that there's a way to have the people that need the money get to the money without having all this nonsense in between. And that's where the money gets lost and it doesn't get down to the people that need the money. Uh, we have normalized homelessness in our city and it, people are homeless for many different reasons. It's not just like you're homeless because you're mentally ill or sometimes you're, you have mental illness or you have bad on your luck or your comedy career died. Or like, I know people in my, my own field that have been in shelters. So it's, you know, people normalize like the, the crazy guy that's homeless. It's a no, it right. could be your no. brother, it could be your best friend. So, 
you know, we need to look at the homeless as human beings. And I, I'm sick of seeing that. I've lived in the city my entire life. I'm 50 years old and I do not believe that homelessness should be normalized anymore. It's not a normal state of being. Uh, and people that are homeless need the help, you know, need to figure out how to find a home. Sometimes these people, it's not money, believe it or not. It's just mental illness. You, there have been homeless, not all the time, but there are people they find they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank account. You know, I mean, that's not common, but you'll see those stories. So it's a mental health issue a lot of times. Uh, some people are, have, are, are victims of domestic violence. Uh, it's all different things. So, we, you know, I, I believe that people should be kept with their pets if they're homeless, if they possibly can. Because that, that, that um, companion animal might be the only loving being they have in their lives. So, wow. That's sad. It really, I mean, yeah. it hits you because these are real issues that people are experiencing right now. And a part of what we do here in the program is we try to take libertarian candidates talking about these libertarian ideas to the problems that we're seeing out there and help convey it to your average person. And and right there, Stacey, you, you're, you're hitting it so perfectly. Like, these are people. You can't just look at homeless people as, as the homeless. Like, no, no, no. People. They're people, just it's like you and me. Things, just and like the situations, and yeah, the situations, you never know what, what led to them being where they are. So instead of saying, well, that could never happen to me. No, it quite literally could. I mean, that's, I think, maybe the beauty of a show like Shit's Creek, um, to see a show like that where it does take the, the hoity-toity and put them into a situation where now they're amongst the normals. <laughs> and that's something a lot of people are saying, like, hey, it could happen to anybody. And to the next step... It could make it even worse. You could end up homeless. And, and let's not look at them as, as you know, just the others in society. Let's figure out real solutions that are out there to help make their lives better, to help. So it's no longer a, a situation where we think, ah, somebody else is going to take care of that. No, let's build the solutions so we can be the ones to take care of that. Housing stability is very important. And among artists, a lot, uh, to, we've never, like, my community has been like vaudeville. People get paid in cash often. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, if, if you claim it or not, that's not my business, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, you know, there's gotta be accountability sometimes. So when things like this happen that you could get any services that you might be entitled to, you know, that that's another issue. Luckily they had this pandemic unemployment for people because other pe people would have been screwed really badly and really, really, really starving and, so, and homeless, you know? So, um, you know, the government messed it up. They got to fix it. You know, <laughs> they did. Yeah. They messed stuff up and they had to, you know, it's like, but I think what this pandemic might have done was bring things to the surface yeah. to show the needs. You know, things have to fall down. A society needs to fall to be able to go into, into the wreckage and see what's underneath all the crap. And I think this is what happened in this pandemic. And yeah. I'm, well, and I'm ready bored. to build back those bricks stable in a, in a stable way, not in a half but half-assed way, but I want to build it back up steady and surely and, and slowly and carefully the right way and taller and bigger than ever before. That's my goal as mayor. Yeah. Well, and, and Stacey, I think honestly, it's, it's a compelling and it's, it's candidly a conversation that we're, we're seeing more and more as had Trisha Butler. She is the council member down in the 12th ward in Clarksville, Tennessee. She wow. won her race as a libertarian <laughs> for that. I know, right. We don't get to see too many wins out there, but when we do, we like to raise them up and and to talk about the opportunity that it creates. We can know, or rather, we, we no longer in a situation where we're just talking about this stuff. And rather, now we can start to point to concrete examples that policy is helping real people. So, I mean, goodness, if we can start to help some real people, especially in what, one of the largest cities in the United States, I think that would be a really good start. So, Stacey, let's kind of finish here. What sure. are, if you were to leave the, the voters in New York City? They're, they're looking down the ballot. They they see Andrew Yang and they make, I don't even know who the sacrificial lamb is for the GOP. Um, but they're looking for somebody out there uh, who is going to hear their voice. So when they look at the libertarian candidate, why should they trust that that voice is going to be heard by you? Because I'm going to listen to the people. I, I'm not coming from a party perspective. I'm coming from a people perspective. And I believe I want to allow you to thrive. I'm not going to pro prohibit your business or you, you, your, your home or you, to build on your home. I want to make it as free as possible. And I want to make it as seamless as possible for you to live in our city. And I don't know, think any other candidate will do that. I think they're going to make it difficult. They're going to create a lot of bureaucracy and I want to do the opposite. So that's why I think people in New York should vote for me. 
I, 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 I want to see that work. And I want to work for the yeah. I was going to say, they don't, I don't think people realize. I'm from New York, not New York City. I'm from upstate New York. Well, I say it quite a bit in the show, but uh, when I'm talking to people, they always hear I'm in Philadelphia and they assume that I just was born and raised in Philly. But no, I've and I've watched over the past 20, 30 years of New York City completely changing, you know, watching it from, you know, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. America's Mayor with Rudy Giuliani and then 9 11 and then just going from that to Bloomberg and it kind of getting to your point, very corporate y and weird. And then, people looking for that return to something more of like a populist mentality. And that's where you get de Blasio. And then it gets to a point where, well, rubber's hitting the road. Now we need people to actually put up or shut up and people are leaving in mass and there's a huge bill to, that needs to be paid. And a lot of people are saying, well, now what? And, and now Stacey, we have a chance to say now what? And it's having now a what? libertarian candidate. That's right. And and now the answer is I you. I want the spirit back into the city. Really? And like New York needs to be fun again. I know that sounds so, unimportant to people after this pandemic but like yeah fun is a healing place of healing and it needs to be fun and yes functional and you know all that stuff but we need our spirit back yes and just like we lost our spirit we said in the beginning of the show we need our spirit back and i'm the person to do that with all Alan. right I, I like that. <laughs> Let's get that spirit back, folks. So we see it for the video version of the, the show, folks. It's at the bottom of the, the screen here, going across at Stacy with an E Pressman. But we will make sure we include that link to all social media, Stacy. But with that being said, obviously, folks, we want to make sure we're directing people not just towards her social media, but to the website. And that is Pressman for Mayor dot com. Stacy Pressman. Thank you so much for running Thanks for that office. Word, you don't want to uh, type a lot. It's P. Yeah. With the number four M P four with the four, you know, the number four M yep. dot N C. <laughs> it leads to the, it's, it's a it's a short it's a short a shorter thing, but uh, so people don't have to type so much. But yeah, donate. We need donations, yes. volunteers. Uh, we're in petitioning season, so yeah, please come, uh, donate, volunteer, anything that you can do. Spread the word. Let's get elected. Let's do this, New York. Wake That's the right. up, New York. Wait the F up New York. I like it. There you go. That could be a nice little uh, teaser for folks here as they join us here on our Sunday candidate highlight series. Thank you, Stacey Pressman. She is running for mayor of Thank New you. York City as a libertarian. Stacey Pressman, thanks for joining the Brian Nichols Show. Thank you. Alrighty, folks, that's our about the conversation with Stacey Pressman. Thank you so much, Stacey, for joining the program. And thank you for running for office. Yes, as a Liberty Warrior in New York City of all places. Hey, this is where we need to be entering conversations where people truly need to hear the ideas of liberty. They're looking for solutions right now. And thank you to Stacey for helping fight the good fight in running for office there as a libertarian candidate for New York City Mayor. Folks, if you want to go ahead and help support Stacey's campaign, please. I will head, uh, or I'll include rather the links in the show notes. Make sure you head down there and go ahead and uh, give her not just a, a look, but also make sure you go ahead and give her a follow and please share Stacey's, uh, Stacey's content, help raise awareness to her campaign. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to reach a lot of people where they're at. Uh, so folks, please, as you're going ahead and uh, helping share Stacey's content, make sure you share today's episode as part of that. And you can go ahead and tag me when you share it at B Nichols Liberty, Twitter, Facebook, Minds.com, and Parlor.com. And yes, folks, if you enjoy the episode in particular, well, two things. Number one, of course, we have our YouTube version here. So if you uh, you have not had the chance yet, head over to the YouTubes, hit that subscribe button, and make sure you hit the little bell icon so you're not missing a single episode. Then every episode you watch, please do me a quick solid head down and hit that little like button right down at the very bottom of the video. Um, and then also, folks, head over to Apple Podcasts. If you really enjoy the show, give us a quick five-star rating and review. Tell folks what value you get from the program. I know that you're you're coming back every single week along with the tens of thousands of listeners each month. So please head over to the Apple Podcast. Give us a quick five-star rating and review. Or you want to go ahead and uh, really, I mean, really put your money where your mouth is. You can quite literally do that by becoming a supporter of our Patreon. And hey, I have to make it a little bit more of an incentive for you guys to join, right? Because I'm not giving you, you know, what a couple, a uh, couple hundred hours of, of shows per per month or something like that. Is a hundred hours now? Well, in time devoted, probably. But hey, how about this? A nice don't hurt people, don't take people's stuff bumper sticker. Five dollar a month patrons, every single one. I will go ahead and fire that your way. And all you have to do is become a $5 a month supporting listener of the program. How easy is that? That's like what a cup of coffee every single month. Can you possibly? See in your hearts to spare $5 a month to help support 
one of the fastest growing Liberty podcasts out there who are helping teach people how to effectively sell and communicate the ideas of Liberty to change more people's minds so we can get Liberty in our lifetimes. Is that worth $5 a month? I think so. Well, folks, if, if you agree with me and you want to help support the vision here at the program, help grow the program, $5 a month patrons, I would re really, truly, greatly appreciate your support. Link in the show notes here as well. And also, as a final ask, folks, please make sure you support our amazing sponsors here on the program from Ebel's My Delta 8 to Thrive Markets, Mudwater, Proud Libertarian, and more. We have amazing sponsors, and I cannot thank you enough for continuing to support them. And also, thank you as uh, we wrap up our, our Sunday Candidate Series today to my amazing team. As we continue to grow here at the program, I would not be able to do it without my team. So every so often, I like to make sure I give them a nice quick shout out because they are what keeps the engine going. So thank you to Chris, Chris, Hunter, Frankie, and of course, my lovely wife, Caitlin. You guys are entirely uh, the, the glue that keeps this thing together. And uh, I, of course, Bill, I, I have to give you a shout out because Bill has been doing amazing work here in the audio end. And I want to also give him a special shout out because at the end of the show you hear, I give Bill a, a quick teaser a plug. And then if you want to go ahead and check out if you have a show or if you have audio work that needs to be done, please go ahead, check out Bill, um, give him an email. Um, he does amazing work. And, and you know, it's great to know that if I ever forget that I have a show, um, Bill, will, or Bill will email me and say, hey, Brian, you have a show coming up. Did you do your intro and outro yet? Uh, so and I say, oh, yeah, that's right. I need to get that over to you. Don't die. So not only does he do a ph uh, phenomenal audio work, but he also keeps me to task, which for those of you who know me, it, it, that can be a little difficult because I go a million different places. So with that being said, Thank you to everyone who helps make this show possible. And as we continue to grow the program, both in terms of what we're doing here in the YouTubes, but also what we're going to be doing in terms of uh, growing our Patreon, what services, classes, trainings we're going to be having for you guys, folks, make sure you're not missing a single thing that's happening here at the program at the network. Uh, so head over to your, your favorite podcast, catch your Apple podcast, wherever it may be, hit subscribe, hit the subscribe in the YouTubes. But with that being said, folks, what do you have coming in store for you tomorrow? Well, how about this? It's in, if you're on Sunday, obviously you're going to catch the YouTubes tonight, but Dr. Patrick Moore from the, one of the original founders actually of Greenpeace, he joins the program to talk all things about, and I wrote it down specifically because I love the way he said it, the unified theory of scare tactics. I love it because what do we know in sales, what sells fear and love. So when we talk to Dr. Moore, we get to hear how we, we see fear permeate through a lot of the narratives that are promoted through our, not only a policy, but our political discourse. And we need to start being more aware of when we see fear being presented as the reason we have to make a decision, right? We see this in sales as well. If you start to see fear creeping into your buying decision, take a time out, maybe remove yourself because you're starting to get a little too emotional involved into that buying decision. So Dr. Moore joins the program, not only to discuss how fear does sell, but really how the, the entire narratives that have been promoted by a lot of our scientific experts over the past 20, 30, 40 years, it's really gotten to the point where we have to be skeptical of the skeptics. And um, it's a great chance to hear his entire context being a, a truly a scientific mind focusing, number one, on helping found Greenpeace with the goal of helping conserve the environment, helping promote environmentalism to seeing how it has turned into an anti-humanity movement. A great conversation with Dr. Moore coming up here tonight for you, YouTube listener on Sunday night, and for you longtime audio listener dropping here on Monday morning. So that being said, folks, I know that was a lot as we wrap up our Sunday episode, but thank you so much for sticking with me. And with that being said, thank you so much to Stacey Pressman for joining the Brian Nichols Show. So with that being said, we'll see you later tonight and we'll see you on Monday. Thanks for listening to the Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.